Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. Glad you could join me. Hope your off season is, well, going as well as can be, considering we don't get to hunt. Hopefully you're spending some time with your dog, maybe improving your shooting. Hey, I better write those things down. Well, we're going to help you do both of those, among other things, this week on the show. Ryan O'Shaughnessy joins me. He's an outfitter, a guide in West Texas. We'll be talking strongly about scaled quail, but a little bit about everything else as well. Tips and advice, hacks, and uh, other things that might help you, no matter what you're shooting at. We'll talk about your weekend and mine, your thoughts on what a guy can do to support conservation. The Handle It segment is all about introducing birds to a dog. And our public access segment is full of strategies for walk-in areas. So if you are um, a wild bird hunter on public ground, um, maybe I should say this uh, show is dedicated to you. But they all are now that I think about it. It's what we love most. Well, I've spent most of my time getting ready to head for warmer weather. Yes, um, we're at the point where we can do everything we want to do here in our house from some other house or RV, which is what we're going to do. We're going to do um, a first go at uh, snowbirding and conduct all of our business um, digitally, including maybe an upcoming podcast. It depends, but anyway... Can't wait to get out of here. We had three inches of snow this morning. Uh, how about you? Making a little bit of a a dent in your training schedule? Uh, here it is, that's for sure. But, you know, as long as you're dressed for it, and I'll never forget from an old, old, old version of the NAVDA Green Book, pictures of a, a wire-haired pointing Griffon being trained in about eight inches, ten inches of snow, and I uh, thought, man, that's crazy, but it's not. And you know it as well as I. And uh, luckily, that is uh, the joy of what we do. We can do it anywhere, anytime. And uh, hopefully we're doing it fairly frequently. But we're also thinking of last season and we're thinking of this season. And boy, the uh, Facebook question I asked a couple of weeks ago is still still getting traction. So I thought I'd uh, go back and maybe help everybody remember what it was like back when there wasn't quite as much inclement weather. And um, so uh, the question was, you know, among other things, one of the top reasons we go hunting is to be in a beautiful place. And I've talked about a few of these things, but um, I think they're worth looking at once again, including Jeff Weiland's photo of a beautiful beautiful scene on a pond somewhere in the Willamette Valley of Oregon the photo he says is by Phil Fisher and it is just a beautiful picture of a male sprig uh, reflected almost a mirror image on the water thanks a lot for that one Jeff and thanks Phil great job Uh, Elijah Barber talks about talks about mainly the fact that in Alaska there are such great upland opportunities and And as we know, unfortunately for most of us, that season's just wrapping up or maybe even not even done yet, but beautiful picture of of a wire hair on a big rock and um, misty morning it looks like with some wet ground. You know, it, it has the look of Alaska if you had to, you know, find it in the dictionary. James Falconer's got a photo of four mule deer alongside some uh, round bales somewhere he won't tell us where but he says being from michigan but seeing mule deer on the horizon i know i'm hunting in the awesomely beautiful west yes indeed saw mule deer this morning running fleck but we're luckier than most in that regard we're all lucky in our own way kevin mclaughlin says it's all about the adventure and it looks like man it looks like a giant mountain way in the distance almost obscured by clouds except for the base snow covered base and then sagebrush in the um, foreground uh, long walk between here and that mountain but that's okay isn't it Uh, 
And Ken Matye, I think I s probably took a wild guess at that one, showing us a close shot from his duck blind, it looks like, Northern California rice fields. Beautiful shot, kind of pink sky in the distance uh, over a bank of clouds with some open water in front of us. And I'll bet a loyal dog right next to the camera there. Keep up the good work. There is so much beauty out there. That's why we go. One of the many reasons, at least, that we go. I am so glad to share those with the rest of you, and I am appreciative of your sharing them with us. Okay, just about ready for Ryan O'Shaughnessy. He is hanging fire waiting for us. First off, though, the Upland Nation podcast is brought to you in part by Sage and Breaker Gun Care Products. Crafted at the highest caliber, sageandbreaker.com. By the way, those are Fred Bohm's dog's names. He's got good taste in company and dog names there. Fred will always give you free shipping and get on his mailing list. That way you'll find out about all the new stuff before everybody else does. It's all at sageandbreaker.com. And UplandNationDeals.com is where you find all that stuff that you um, are looking for, but maybe are trying to economize on just a little bit. Pro-level gear at entry-level prices. It's lightly used, and uh, my job there is to help you buy and sell. So if you've got an old collar or any other kind of gear that's just kind of gathering dust, turn it into dollar bills instead at UplandNationDeals.com. Dot com. Yeah, so uh, take yourself in your mind to Alpine, Texas. Yeah, there is a place called Alpine, Texas, and no, it didn't get beat up with the winter that those other folks got. But uh, welcome to the Upland Nation podcast, Ryan O'Shaughnessy. How's the weather out there, my friend? It is 77 degrees outside today, which makes a big difference from four degrees last week. Oh, I believe it. And uh, and and uh, when we were putting this all together, you said you guys didn't get beat up near as much as the folks a little bit farther east. So good for you. But you did suffer a little bit, didn't you? Yeah, we lost power for a few days, and with uh, three little girls, um, um, uh, we had to get creative with uh, keeping them warm at night until the power came back on. Oh, I bet. Yeah, I, you know, it's bad enough around here, but when when you got kids, things multiply themselves exponentially, I'm sure. They do, they do, but they took it well. They enjoyed the snow. Um, um, I think we tend to forget they're a lot tougher than we are. Yeah, much more resilient. You know, you, you look up resilience in the dictionary, and there ought to be a nine-year-old in that, you know, for the picture. <laughs> too right. Yep, you know, too right. <laughs> I, learned, I learned that from teaching. <laughs> yep. Oh, they were running around outside barefooted in, in, in the snow. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay, so, uh, of course, they're already asking. I can almost guarantee it. So let's just start at the beginning and keep going. All right, West Texas Quail Outfitters. Um, you know, that is the strangest Texas accent I've ever heard. Why don't you just lay it all out for us? Get it over with, Ryan. Sure, sure. Let's let's delve into it. It's the first thing that everybody asks me. Um, um, Scott, I, I, I recently, as of about a year and a half ago, I always tell people that I'm from very far west Texas, that I'm from um, El Paso. Um, I was naturalized in El Paso about a year and a half ago. Um, but my upbringing, I was born and raised in, in Southern Africa. Um, I was born in Zimbabwe um, and uh, spent my upbringing uh, between Botswana, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. Um, and then about, uh, let's see, gosh, about 12, 13 years ago, I met my wife, who is from Florida, and she said, hey, what about uh, coming back to the States with me? And uh, so I, I did that. That was about 10 years ago, and uh, the rest is history. Yeah, and uh, and here you are doing. Yeah, I mean, you might be the only scaled quail uh, emphasis 
outfitter I've ever spoken with. Uh, so I'm going to pick your brain and then repick it. And then we're going to, sure? they're going to put it in the fridge and we're going to come back the next day, skim off the fat and pick some more because, uh, they are my nemesis. And for others, they are kind of one of those bucket list birds. And for others, they are, they are just an unknown quantity. Right. So, so tell us about your operation. Um, so, Scott, we for for, for those of, of your listeners that are familiar with with Texas um, and and Texas quail hunting, we very much run our operation the old traditional way. Um, so, while we do have jeeps that are outfitted with the high seat and dog boxes, we, we literally just use those jeeps to drive to uh, water tanks on on the properties that we lease. Um, like I say, we do things the old fashioned way. We'll hit a water point, we'll jump out, and we'll go for a good long stroll from that particular location. Um, we follow the dogs. We like to try to shoot the birds over pointed dogs. Um, we will walk on average, I would say, I would say on average 12 miles a day. Um, the, the pups are probably putting in 25 to 30 miles a day for you. Um, so, yeah, we're very much, even though we're based in Texas, we certainly don't spend all day in the rig we we spend all day putting uh, rubber on the ground um, so a good pair of boots is is a must you know you just mentioned the magic ingredient i think in scaly hunting and that is water um you're in cattle country to a great degree and so you talk right. about tanks all the time but uh, yep. uh, is is there any natural water and are the birds as inclined to go to natural water as to those man-made structures any natural water, I would say, just from, from what I've observed over the last seven, eight years out here, um, those birds would much prefer to go to, to natural water. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, one of my recommendations, whenever I have a landowner ask me what, what the one thing is that they can do to better manage their property for quail, I'll tell them have a leaky trough. Yeah, um, yeah. If you've got water standing on the ground, you know, they're not perching birds, they're ground dwelling birds. So any water that's standing on the ground is far, far easier for them to, to get to and to drink from. Um, but yeah, and, and in a simplistic form, yeah, if you've got a dirt tank, they'd much rather use a dirt tank over, say, a metal trough. Yeah. Um, uh, the other thing that, uh, yeah, I, in fact, I came across a hat I got on a scale quail hunt many years ago. I, I didn't find it on the hunt. I found it in the lodge. But, uh, sure. but anyway, it reminded me that so much of that scaled quail hunting, some people are all about, and you're not, we know that, you just told me that, you confess that you guys are walking for these birds. A lot of the yep. time people are there it's run and gun i mean you're driving along and you get close to the water and all of a sudden everybody just piles out and starts running after birds right right um, and go ahead uh, i was gonna say and we we um you know we, we we certainly don't shy away from uh um, stepping up the pace while we're after a covey um you know these little uh running devils they know how to get away from predators um be it, be it natural or or human um and and certainly when they get into some of that more open country where there's not a lot of grass to, to hold them we've been known to to break out in a in a light uh, trot after the birds yeah safety first of course exactly yeah. yep of course <laughs> okay so, so um you mentioned one of the, one of the other i believe i will call it a difference between let's call them all the other western quail and scalies and that is the habitat itself besides water and where you're going to find them what are the other things that are critical to scaled quail habitat well, your scale quail generally, they, they prefer about a 50-50 mix of cover to open ground. Um, you know, one of the big fundamental differences um, with, with your scale quail is, is that they like to run first and foremost. That's their, their primary method of escape. Um, so they're very different from, say, your Merns quail or your bobwhite quail that like to, to hide as a method of escape. Um, so because of that running nature of the, the, those little birds, that's probably why we can cover 10 miles a day on, on foot very, very easily. 
Um, but like I say, because of that, they do tend to prefer slightly more open country compared to a lot of your other upland birds that we've got out here. Um, if if that, that cover's too thick, well, they just can't run away, um, which does lend itself to hunting them and, and trying to get them to run into the thicker cover to slow them down and hold them up. Um, but they are so in tune with their environment and where they need to run to and, and even where they need to flush to to be able to get away from us. What, what, are, what are their primary um, uh, habitat components? What kind of plant life and what are they eating? And, and uh, describe the, the area where you're hunting these Sure. So, so out here um, where we are, um, we're in the Chihuahuan Desert. Um, as you go further west up into New Mexico and then into to Arizona, you start transitioning into the Sonoran Desert. So, w w these birds very much are a are a desert dwelling bird. I mean, I know you can find them up into the grassy plains in Colorado, but generally their, their stronghold is from far west Texas into southeastern Arizona. Um, so you're going to find them in, in grassy cactus flats. Um, we get um, a lot of mesquite out here too, um, that low-growing um, honey mesquite's great for them because they can run in there, they can hide, um, they can use that to roost overnight. Um, choya cactus, um, C-H-O-L-L-A, those flats are, are generally covered up with, with the guys. Um, and then another one, um, and, and this is a, a colloquial name for it out here, it's, it's another cactus called Tasehio. It's got a red berry on it, and, and those little quail love feeding on that stuff. And it's about the worst cactus on the planet, in my opinion. Um, I've, I've literally had to carry dogs out of stands of that cactus. Now, is that the um, one? Uh, when I was down in Arizona, we called it, I think we called it jumping cactus. Is it the same yeah. one? I believe it's the same one because if you're walking and it gets on, on, on the side of your pants, I mean, it'll literally work its way up the side of your leg while you're walking. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about dogs and cactus later on as well because it is is one of those things other people, other pro trainers have said they got to learn how to do it themselves. Dogs got to yeah, learn absolutely. to pull that out. I mean, is it, yep, have absolutely. you found that to be true? Yeah, I have. Um, by and large, uh, depending on the cactus, I'll, I'll leave the dogs to their own devices and, like you say, just let them figure it out. Um, that tasahia or jumping cactus or choya, that can be difficult because of the extent of the spines on those cacti. Um, I've seen dogs try to pull them out and then get the, 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 the part of the cactus stuck in their mouth. Yeah. Um, so generally, I, I've always got a, a hemostat um, or a set of pliers on my bird vest that I'll use just to grab that piece of cactus and flick it off. Tell me a little bit about how the hunt goes when, when we come over to West Texas Quail Outfitters. I mean, we're staying near the hunting area, but we're not, we're in town, if you will, whatever town is out there. Um, yep. And then how does it go? We, uh, we meet you and then we're going to do what? Right, Scott. So we currently lease, I would say in the region of about 600, 650,000 acres. Um, we're spread out over about, uh, I think it's 11 different properties. And so what we will do is we've got those properties on a, round, uh, on a rotation. So if uh, Scott Linden called up tomorrow and said, hey, Ryan, we want to come out and hunt with you, I would look at the calendar and the dates that you wanted to come out, and I would say, great, Scott, why don't you stay in Alpine? Um, and that would be the, the, the town closest to that particular ranch that we were going to hunt um, um, over your dates. We would then make a recommendation to you for one of the local hotels. Um, we generally pick you up around 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we head out into the field. We're, we're normally on um, the, the, the ranch by about 8.30. Um, we hunt until about 12.30, 1 o'clock, um, whereby we'll break and we return to, to where my truck and trailer are. 
car and we'll cook a lunch for you out in the field. Um, we've been known to to open a bottle or two of wine to complement uh, uh, lunch, uh, to be civilized while we're out there. And uh, then we'll carry on hunting for the afternoon and generally have you back um, to your hotel around 6, 6.30 in the evening. Um, Everything is provided for you. We've got waters. We've got soft drinks. Uh, obviously, all the dogs on board, your guide, the Jeep, and uh, tea, coffee, um, and, and pretty much what it, what, whatever um, you think you could need. Are you, um, uh, are you um, experiencing warmer weather that time of year? I mean, I'm thinking about dogs in the desert, and I know what it's like when I'm in the desert with my dog. Uh, how do you... How do you cope with what we'll consider relatively warm weather it's sure so that's that's a great question and and um the funny enough it's, it's one that we get asked all the time when people make bookings with us they always say hey well when's the best time of year to come out and hunt with us um depending on the availability i will always recommend january or february um, in November and December can can be kind of unpleasant, to be honest, particularly November. Um, we, we may still be hitting temperatures in the mid to high 80s during November. So during November, you really have to be careful with the dogs. Um, if we can, I, I'll try to take at least eight dogs with me. Um, I'll leave four in the, in the truck. Um, um, we'll take four out in the morning. Um, obviously, before we're doing a walk, because we hunt from water sources, I'll dunk those dogs in the water um, before we set off for a walk just to keep them nice and cool. Um, obviously, when we get back to the Jeep, dunk them in the water again before putting them um, putting them up um, after the walk. Um at lunchtime, we'll switch out uh, the, the four dogs on the ground and put fresh dogs down. Wow, that is a big string and a, a mob scene at any given point. How are you handling four dogs and, uh, and maintaining your sanity? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, and, 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 yeah, that's a good that's a good question, Scott, and, and um, it, it will take a little bit of clarification. We, we generally only have two dogs on the ground at any given time. Uh -huh. um, so let's say wh while we're out for for the morning hunt, we may do let's say five or six walks during the morning um, um, uh, joint, and I will o alternate the dogs two by two at every walk okay all right well that sounds yeah almost you know i've i've been known to do that so if i can do it you could do it well right <laughs> <laughs> um tell us a little bit let's let's get to know scaled quail cotton tops some people call them blue quail yep you probably have a few other names for them at the end of a long day um but this is a family podcast yeah, so. i was gonna say <laughs> we have some names for them none none that i'll mention yes, <laughs> on, but I, on but air. I, I do know how you got those names for them uh, what's that bird's day like tell us what they're doing uh, they they are they covering up like bob whites uh, in a little circle tell us about a bird a day in the life of a bird yeah so these little uh, scaled quail they, they will cover up like your bob white do at night um one of the 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 things that makes scaled quail pretty popular with 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 hunters is that you can find these birds in massive coveys um we we found them in coveys 30 40 50 birds when they cover up at night People tend to think that all of those birds will cram under some vegetation somewhere to keep warm. But I'm sure most people have seen those great little photographs of all these quail um, in a circle with their, with, with their little butts shoved together. Well, you can only get about seven or eight birds in each of those little circles. So when you've got a big covey, let, let's say 20 birds for argument's sake, you may have three different groups of birds breaking up under three different bushes in, in an area to cover up at night. That is um, fascinating. 
Yeah, and, and, and Scott, that often explains why um, you tend to get a lot of false points on, on these mm-hmm. scaled mm-hmm. quail. Um, and, and that's just because, I mean, think about it. If you've got a covey of 50 birds that are all breaking up into groups of six, seven, eight birds, that's a lot of scent spread out around, a, around an area where these birds have been roosting at night. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's um, fascinating. Yeah, and then um, when when daybreak comes, early morning, they'll get out, they'll go out and feed for a little while, get some water. Um, we tend to see a lull during midday where, where they'll cover you up again and get out of the heat or, or get out of the cold during the, the midday hours. Um, and then they're getting active again um, middle to late afternoon. They'll get out, start feeding again, start trying to find some water, um, and then look for, for a new roosting uh, location. So, um, hey, everybody, you're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden. I'm the host. I get to ask all the dumb questions. The smart answers are coming from Ryan O'Shaughnessy at West Texas Quail Outfitters. I'm going to say near Alpine, Texas. I I don't imagine you're in, you know, downtown Alpine, if there is such a thing. But, uh, you so so what kind of strategies are we using if we're in scaled quail country what you know what, 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 if, or is there such a thing well i, I always say we're in the desert it, it doesn't yeah. take a genius to work out you're in the desert everything in the desert needs water um so we tend to hunt the waters um over the years we we record every covey that we flush um, between myself and, and, and my guides that, that work with me. Um, we'll drop a, a GPS location of every covey that we flush. Uh, one of my guides, Josh, he's a geographic information system whiz. So he plots all those locations out on, on maps of these, these ranches. And invariably, you're seeing those hot spots located around water. Um, and, and so that's that's our primary strategy. Um, other than that, when you're out uh, in the field and you bust a covey and you see where they land, we have tried everything. Uh, other people might have had better success. We've tried circling the birds. We've tried using hawk calls to get those birds to set tight. Heck, I've even tried throwing frisbees over them to mimic a, a, an aerial predator and, and, and try to get them to set tight. But um, I can tell you, you spend a heck of a lot of time fetching a frisbee. <laughs> Good boy, good boy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the best method we found is, is just to go after them directly. Yeah. Um, as, as that cubby is running away from you, you tend to have singles and pairs breaking off from the cubby and, and, and starting to hold tight. So as you're walking behind those birds, you start to get uh, some of your quintessential dog points and flushes where, where you, you can then get uh, lucky and take uh, the odd bird or two. I'll never forget one of my first days on Scalies. We we saw that big bunch and we're chasing them through the brush, and pretty soon there's some peeling off left, peeling off right. Pretty yep. soon, by the time we get to the end of the draw, we're chasing nothing. They've all peeled uh, <laughs> off. I was just going to say that happened to us this past weekend. I think we we got on a covey of about thirty birds, and uh, we were following through through a creosote flat. And every now and then you could see just a little white top flicker through through the brush. And, oh, great, let's keep going. They're still in front of us. And um, we must have walked about four or 500 yards and realized, heck, we didn't have a clue where those birds went. Mm. Um, we, we just lost that covey. So uh, I, I, have, I have a couple of theories, um, Scott. Uh, number one, I think they live in tunnels underground. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think um, as biologists too, and, and you can take this to the bank, um, I think on days when you can't find any scaled quail, the, the obvious reason is because they've migrated. Yes, they do fly north for the winter, don't they? <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, those, and, and when they fly, yeah. they fly behind the moon so you can't see them. So, <laughs> too right. That's yeah. why nobody's ever witnessed it. No, uh, in fact, uh, we'll get to pointing dogs in a moment. i got to tell you my, my next Cimarron River story. We were hunting over a, a part on the Cimarron that actually the, the river's underground, so they say, maybe in that tunnel with the birds. But... Uh, so my dog finally does point, and I'm thinking, okay, so we got it figured out. 
And then I realized he wasn't pointing. He was standing on a grove of sand burrs and would not oh, move. Shame. Do you yeah. de- do you deal with that out there? Fortunately, not. Um, as you go a little further west from we are, um, I've got one lease. It's, it's it's probably our furthest lease west here in Texas. You, you you there are a few patches of those sand burrs, um, but fortunately, ninety nine point nine percent of of our country out here, we don't have to worry about it, um, which is which is really a blessing. Um, I, I do caution people, though, when, when they want to bring their dogs out to, to hunt, we can get into some pretty rocky country. Um, and, and so the real challenge there is not having dogs that aren't used to these conditions cut up pads on the rocky terrain. Well, let's talk about that because, I'm, in fact, I'm writing something about this right now, and it's been the, most, uh, the most popular blog post I've ever written was about alternatives to dog boots. Yeah, so great. So uh, you, you're out there day in, day out, all season dealing with this issue. How do you deal with your dog's pads? So how we deal with it is just conditioning. Um, when we get new dogs coming into our string um, and and all through the summer, we are pretty meticulous about roading our dogs um, to to keep their pads tough. Um, Of course, we've tried things like boots over the years and um, um, uh, all the creams that mushers use. And to be honest, I've never found any great success in those other than just conditioning. you know, if clients come out and they want their dogs to, if they want to boot their dogs, that's fine. But generally you see a, a pretty drastic decline in the range of that dog. Um, because just like you and I trying to run around in, in, in flippers, if, if you're not used to it. Um, so like I say, the, the real key for us, even through the summer months, uh, about three times a week in, in, in the evenings when the temperatures have started to cool, we'll road our dogs about three to five miles uh, two or three times a week just to ensure that we keep those pads nice and tough. Excellent. You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. That's Ryan O'Shaughnessy, West Texas Quail Outfitters. Ryan, you get a brief respite from uh, uh, talking, but you still must listen to me while I get us through a commercial break. And then right after that, we'll be talking about our Handle It segment. And I've got a listener question on prey drive in a young dog. So stick around, everybody. And this portion of the Upland Nation podcast is brought to you by Dr. Tim's Performance Dog Food. Talking about pads, talking about coat, talking about all those things that matter. The the first line of defense for your dog, fats, will help in that regard, but so will carbohydrates, especially late in the season. If you're looking, looking to keep your dog energized towards the end of a long hunting season, remember, yeah, fat is what gives a dog the most concentrated form of energy but carbohydrates are just as critical for other reasons and dr tim hunt uses whole oat groats and rice as the carbohydrate sources because they will also regulate your dog's blood glucose you know you've heard you've seen dogs that are tipping over from the back end you can call it low blood sugar but whatever it is blood glucose is really critical those two forms of carbohydrates are one way to keep those levels level that's why so many iditarod winners feed dr tim's performance dog food Get more information and 30% off your first order at drtims.com. Just use the code UPLANDNATION. So thank you for all these great questions. I love answering these questions. I hope they're of use to everybody else as well. But this one came in a couple days ago and I've been been chomping at the bit to, to deal with it. 
He says, uh, my six-month-old setter just, uh, you know, is pretty good on the training stuff, but when we go out into the woods, he just doesn't get excited about birds. And um, so I started probing a little bit, asking about how much bird contact that dog has had. And it reminds me of all those NAVDA training days where we're out there helping people who are, you know, a little less experienced than us. And it turns out that it's the same dang problem there as well. For many dog owners, the only bird contact they get is at that training day. And if you don't have a NAVDA chapter or a NASTRA chapter or anything else, your dog might not have met a bird until bird season. What's he going to do? All right. So anyway, lecture time. Give that dog some bird contact as soon as possible. Early on, it can be a dead frozen pigeon, then a thawed dead pigeon, then a live pigeon in a bird sock, and then a wing shackled live bird pigeon later. Show that dog what they're all about and get him excited about the prey that he's going to be searching for. That's how you're going to get that dog to be moving out and questing in the field. No birds, no bird dog. George Hickox, you had it right then and you still have it right now. Handle It is brought to you by Happy Jack Dog Care Remedies, skin coat, parasites, fleas and ticks, even pads. I'll remind you about that in a moment, Ryan. Learn more at happyjackinc.com. Dot com happyjackinc.com okay ryan uh you didn't doze off on your recliner there did you nope i'm still wide away okay so um uh, i i i i gotta apologize i haven't called you dr o'shaughnessy once on the show <laughs> <laughs> Even though you do have a PhD and an MBA. And of course, I'm sure both of those come in really handy when you're guiding scaled quail hunters, right? Well, they, they, they both do. The MBA especially, it, it helps manage the business. The, uh, the PhD, Scott, I think gets me in trouble because uh, people expect you to say something intelligent. And uh, <laughs> if you spoke to my wife, she would say that that happens very, very rarely. <laughs> well, that's her job, too, you know, is to, is to keep you in line, uh, keep you humble, if you will. Right, so, right. <laughs> so, uh, so, okay, I get the romance part of it and coming to Florida. But here you are with uh, two advanced degrees in business and something else. And I'll ask, you know, in your answer, tell us what it's in. But then you get to Florida and now you get to Texas and now you're running bird dogs on scale quail. Okay. Give me the rest of that story. Sure. So I um, um, arrived in Florida. That's where, where my wife's from, like I mentioned earlier. Um, we had a, a brief, uh, well, a, a three, three and a half year stint up in Illinois. That's uh, where I pursued my PhD and I um, um, worked with waterfowl up there. Uh, migratory, uh, spring mi migrating ducks uh, was what my PhD was on. Um, when I was coming to the end of my PhD, a former advisor of mine uh, knew of Alpine, Texas and uh, the university out here, and they were looking for a postdoc. And uh, this former advisor, he called me up. He said, Ryan, I think, I think you should go and check that area out. I think you'd really like it. And he was correct. Um, so came out, uh, interviewed, fortunately got offered the job, and um, six months later we had moved to Texas. You know, I, I, I don't know Zimbabwe or any of those other places well that you, you grew up, but there's probably a lot of similarities in terms of topography, for example. Oh, tremendously, tremendously. I, I, I say to a lot of people, particularly the the western parts of, of, of South Africa um, and Botswana and, and certain areas in Namibia even, if you close your eyes, um, you could be dropped off in, in West Texas or in any of those areas um, in Africa and you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Uh, massive, massive similarity. 
Let's uh, let's talk some more about uh, bird dogs because you run so many. There's got to be some things you've learned from a practicality standpoint, managing yep. a string <laughs> that size uh, that that we can apply to our one and two dog kennels. What what are some of the things that just come to the top of mind when we talk about taking care of dogs? Yeah, good question. Um, so our kennel, uh, Scott, we my personal string is 18 uh, dogs. Oh. And then um, um, between my two guides, we've got another six dogs on top of that. So that's a, that's a total string of, of 24 dogs. Um, just generally speaking, obviously, with, with that many dogs, my, my biggest bit of advice to people who have two or more dogs is, you've got to treat them like children. Uh, no two dogs are the same. No two dogs are going to learn exactly the same way. Um, some dogs require a little bit more pressure. Other dogs don't like pressure at all. Um, your segment where you answered a, a listener's question was, was fantastic. Um, young dogs need birds. Um, George Hickox was right. Feral Miller was correct when they said, y you know, birds make bird dogs. So get as many contacts um, as, as you can early on. I, I get a fair number of clients who who worry about young dogs chasing birds, eating birds, uh, busting coveys. And I always tell them, don't worry about that because if they're chasing those birds and they're busting those coveys as a young dog, it shows that they've got the drive. It is so much easier to work with a dog that has a lot of drive than it is to work with a dog with no drive. Um, so, so uh, yeah, I like you say, get get those dogs on on birds, get that drive ramped up, and then you can start to to work on woeing the dog and handling the dog a lot more efficiently. Um, from a from a, a health point of view. Um, Again, I, I would say treat your dogs like you treat your children. If if you notice something is wrong with one of your dogs, get them to a vet. It, it's the same as, as one of your kids. If you had noticed something was up with one of your children, you would take them to the doctor. Don't waste time with... Um, um, w don't waste time in taking your dog to, to the vet. Um Care is is imperative. Um, I know with us, we're we're actually looking forward to this weekend. Will be the last weekend of our wild bird season. Uh, for the month of March, my dogs hate me because <laughs> I do not let them out of their run. Um, I will keep them in their run. I will keep them on the same quantities. Of, of dog food that I feed them through the season, and I'll keep them on the same high protein, high fat dog food that I feed them during the season or through March just to help them put on some weight. Yeah, you know, it's um, funny. Uh, our season is over, and and uh, and my dog went in skinny and came out skinnier, and right, I've, I've yep. used a whole bunch of <laughs> things to to kind of help in that regard uh and i'll be glad to share them with everybody and i will in a moment but during the season itself what do you do to keep your dogs uh, functioning as as well as they can from a dietetic standpoint scott i i work on on calories um i know a lot of the dog food bags they have your recommended feedings um a lot of brands will usually just have for for a standard dog obviously our bird dogs um anybody's bird dog that's a high energy quail finding machine right um so i will usually f through the season i'll up the feeding the recommended feeding quantity um on the back of your bag you can do a relatively easy calculation you can ask your vet to help you do it you, you can work out what a high energy uh, very active dog needs in terms of calories and you can then compare that to what a cup of dog food whichever brand you're using is going to give you Oftentimes, when you are hunting those dogs, you'll realize that those dogs need quite a bit more food than the recommended feeding um, that's listed on the bag. Um, 
So uh, we've just learned over the years to to do our own math on that to keep those dogs um, healthy through the season. I will supplement it um, once a week. I'll, I'll add some pork lard to their food, just a real high calorie fat pro, um, um, lard that you can buy at just about any grocery store. And I find that that really helps maintain condition too. Uh, I'm liking egg yolks. Egg yolks are fantastic. Um, um, my, my wife and kids love dropping egg yolks into into the dogs' balls too. Yeah, and the dogs love it more than the kids. Right. <laughs> um, what kind of dogs you're running in a string that big? You probably have uh, you know one of everything, but um, are are there breeds that you like and why? Yeah, that's the. So that's another fantastic question that I that I love to answer. Um, so I'll tell you this: when when I was growing up in Botswana, our my first bird dogs were all Weimaraners. Yeah, um, yeah. There's still still a pretty big Weimaraner following in Africa. Um, we're fortunate in that there, there's still some very good hunting bloodlines available in Africa. Um, when I came over to, to the U.S., I had a couple of Weimaraners when we were up in Illinois. Um, and, of course, I brought them with me down to Texas. But with the temperatures being that much warmer down here, I find that my wimes, they, they tend to fatigue a lot faster than a lot of the smaller breeds. Um, so over the years, we've we've got a couple of Britneys, um, we've got one uh, short hair, um, but we very much have transitioned to to mostly pointers. I think uh, we've got fourteen um, um, pointers in in our kennel right now. Um, and before I offend anybody out there, Scott, I'm, I'm, I am going to say that you could you could hold a gun to my head, and, and I'll be honest, I wouldn't be able to tell you that that the pointers outperform my Britneys or my German short hair. I, I, I would never be able to say that. Um, I, I think we've just gone to pointers because for me, um, it's a personal thing. I love just seeing that that tail straight up in the air on point. Um, I've, I haven't had much experience with setters. Um, I think out here that that longer fur may may warm those dogs up a little little, little more than we might be happy with, but um, I certainly wouldn't hang my hat on that comment. Uh, that's Ryan O'Shaughnessy with West Texas Quail Outfitters. I'm Scott Linden. You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. And uh, if you're liking what you're hearing, please rate us, review us at Apple Podcasts. I would appreciate that. Ryan, uh, you just mentioned something that... Um, that uh that clues me in how would you what 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 is your expectation uh, of a finished dog in a big screen big string like that in a commercial guiding operation oh scott how much time do you have (laughs) (laughs) these these are questions that i love sitting and chatting and i'll chat to anybody about them for hours um that that's 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 a question that i think um should give new dog owners um, um, some really good information to everybody's definition of what a finished dog is, is going to vary. Um, I always tell a lot of my clients who come to me looking for advice on how to handle their dog or how to train their dog. I always tell them, train your dog to what you are going to be using that dog for most. So I'll give you an example. If we look at English pointers, um, pointers, my pointers and how they run and operate are going to be very, very different to how a pointer might handle and operate on a Georgia plantation hunt. Because these scaled quail are typically pretty tough birds, and if you knock them down, if they're not dead when they hit the ground, they're going to get up and they're going to run into some cover or they're going to disappear down a hole. So my dogs, I do not have the expectation of my dogs to be steady to wing and shot. When that bird flushes, if I've got clients out and they're going to make a shot, I really do not mind if my dog breaks at a flushing bird bird and it drops i want my dogs to be on that bird as fast as possible so that we 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 don't lose the bird um 
you know, your guys in, in Georgia on your plantations, it's a different story. They might want to release a flushing dog and a retrieving dog after the flush and the shot. So my dogs, I, now, don't get me wrong, I expect them to be to be steady on point. Mm-hmm. And, and um, you know, if they're 150, 200 yards out and they're locked up on point, well, they better not move until me and my guys get over there. Um, but I certainly don't mind them then breaking when that bird flushes or, or a shot goes off. How about that that part you just talked about? You know, these are these birds are notorious, and I've chased them up hills and down hills and through arroyos and everywhere else. Yep. <laughs> how how do you help your dogs uh, get to? Pardon the pun. How do you help them get to the point uh, with running birds like that? So practice. Uh, we are very very fortunate in that uh, we have access to so much country out here, and and so when I've got young dogs and I start running them in the wild, when when I start transitioning from pen raised birds. I try to get them as many contacts as possible. Um, that dog needs to figure it out with these birds. They, they need to figure out, hey, I may not be able to get as close as I can on, on a pen-raised bobwhite, for example. Um, so it's just contacts, contacts, contacts. Uh, running them with a more experienced dog does help. Um, a lot of these dogs have that natural instinct in them when they see a more experienced dog go on point, they will go on point. And and, and so that's really what what we try to do. Um, now don't get me wrong, I, I will put a put a belly collar on just to just to help slow that dog down. Uh, I use all the traditional methods, Scott. You know, I'll put them on a woe barrel and, and try to style them up and, and really make sure they understand what I mean when I'm giving them that command, uh, when I say, whoa, you know, they need to know, hey, that means I, I must stop, right? Um, so it's a lot of reinforcement. Um, but at the end of the day, it's it's bird contacts. That, that's what it comes down to. Yeah, so, um, so like when, yeah. uh, you know, your dissertation committee, um, your dog's dissertation committee is uh, wild birds. Correct. Um, and I will say, Scott, I... I in my experience out here, I would say, and this gets back to, to what I call a finished bird dog in, in my string, I find that my dogs are typically maturing to where I feel comfortable letting one of my guides take a young dog out after two full wild bird seasons or when that dog seems to hit around four, four and a half years old, um, whichever whichever comes first, I, I would say generally at that point, you're starting to, that dog is really starting to mature as, as, a, as a pointer. So, so there's two, two time frames in there. One is four or four and a half years old, and the other is two seasons. What, so what, where do the, where do young young dogs fit into this? You get a dog at I mean, do you, are you getting puppies? Or are you getting started dogs? Or how how are you filling up the the vacancies in your roster? So a little bit of both. We, yeah. We've got four puppies, and, and those um, puppies came from uh, one of my sires and one of my guides, Dams. Um, and I kept four four of the pups. Alternatively, if, if I'm going out and I'm buying a dog, I will look for a starter dog. Um, just because I would like to bring that dog in after he's had some contacts, and then I can finish him with with my commands and on these wild um, um, scaled quail out here. Yeah. Um, and that's why I say typically in my experience, if, if I've got a puppy or I get a very young dog that's say a year old, if I am able to get that dog through two wild bird seasons, I tend to think, okay, 
after that, um, you can see they really start dialing in. Um, alternatively, around that four, four and a half year mark, I, I don't know if it's just the, the, the hormones start to subside a little mm. in those young dogs, but you tend to see them calming down and, and figuring it out a yeah. hell of a lot more at that age, in, in, my, in my experience. In mine, too, I'm thinking the same, very same thing about my current dog, Flick, and he is, he's finally almost there, and that's, I think, part of it. The light bulb finally uh, turns on by itself a little bit more often. It, it, absolutely, and and it, it it has amazed me even this season with with two of my puppies, and and they're about a year and three months old at this point. Um, but I, I was taking them out in the afternoon, and I'll explain to my clients, hey, this is a young dog. Um, I'm going to bring him out for the last walk or two, if that's okay. Um, I'll get, get permission from my clients first. Um, but it's been amazing. It, it, it takes just that one flush and that one instance of everything coming together just right for that light switch to flip. And, and you can literally see it happen and it is just the most amazing and rewarding thing to to witness in a young dog oh uh absolutely and that uh that is exactly what i'm thinking of right now so i think you you've kind of talked around the issue and and most recently that answer but what is it about bird dogs and bird hunting that really really keeps you in the game <laughs> oh boy um Scott, people have asked me, Ryan, you know, would you rather go and hunt chucker in Idaho or fly back to Botswana to shoot a buffalo? And I'll tell them every time I'll load my dogs up and I'm driving to Idaho. Um, I, I think for me, it, it is always, or not always, the older I've gotten, it, it is it has become that relationship and that partnership between you and the dog and, and for everything to come together for, for you to, to harvest a bird and, and have it brought to hand with a partnership with an animal that I love. Um, one story that, that I tell people about three years ago, I went back to Botswana to, to help my family on the farm and one afternoon I thought, heck, um, let me grab one of the shotguns and I'll just take a walk around the farm fields and see if I can't pick up some guinea fowl or some Franklin to shoot for, for dinner. I went for a walk and about seven or eight Franklin ran out of one of our cornfields into the brush. I took the shotgun off my shoulder, I closed it, and I gave the, the relief. And I realized... I don't have any of my dogs. All, all my dogs are, are here in the U.S. And so what I did was I opened that shotgun. I took the shells out of the gun. I put them in my pocket and I went for a walk because the, the beauty of having that partnership with the dog just wasn't there for me. And, 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 and so I thought, well, heck, those little Franklin get to get to go off and do their thing. I'll just go for a walk because the moment was, wasn't what to be with, with my dog. Yeah, um, I think I described it most recently. Uh, last week, I think, on the podcast, a friend of mine and I, we went out one, the morning was with my dog, and then at lunchtime, he, lunchtime he said, I don't, ever want to go hunting without my own dog yeah and, and <laughs> yeah. It, was, it, it was i'd never seen him as serious as that before so um i know i know of what you speak and um and in fact that might that might be a good topic for an article um, yeah <laughs> let's let's get a little practical help us become better dog owners slash trainers slash hunters what are some of the most important things we should uh, do in the field to help our dog be most productive? Scott, I, I would say patience uh, first and foremost. Um, patience with your dog is is critical. Um, patience is, is also the, the easiest. Uh, the, the word that I'm going to use next is probably the most difficult for people to to exercise when training a dog. 
uh, and that is consistency. Um, if you have a dog that, that you've trained a certain set of commands to, it really does yourself and the dog no favors by giving the dog a different command each time. Um, so remaining consistent is is critical. Uh, a, a good example of that for me and my dogs, when, when I want a dog to come in to me, I say heal. Heal is my command for my dog to come to me. A lot of other people will, will say here or, or come. And if, if you start intermixing those words, you confuse the dog. Um, so consistency is, is really important. If you're trying to woe a dog and, and, and the dog is at that point where he really should be woeing on point and he breaks, you want to make a correction pretty much immediately to that dog if possible so that they don't start fig figuring out, oh, well, I can get away with it when, when, you know, when Scott's 100 yards away, I can get away with breaking after these birds. Um, so consistency is, is absolutely critical. Um, but patience, again, is, is very, very important. Uh, my dogs remind me all the time that, that they're dogs. Um, they have good days and they have bad days, just like we do. Um, so there's, there's no point in losing your temper with them or getting angry with them. You know, just acknowledge, hey, okay, um, Red's having a bad day today. I'm going to put him back in, in the dog box and, and let him figure things out for himself um, in, in the dog box before I get him out again. Oh, I love that idea. And uh, I'm trying to do the same thing. And I, I'm really taking to heart what you just said about calling that dog in. I, I actually changed the word heel in my lexicon to walk. So it wouldn't sound like here. But really, sure. you want the, the, the end result is the same thing. You want that dog right there where he's supposed to be. And you don't need Absolutely. two commands. So Absolutely. Uh, I Absolutely. Love it. Um, I've, I've had guys come out and they want to run their dogs and, and, and I've had clients who, who just will be on a whistle from, from sunrise into sunset and they're tooting that whistle for everything. Um, and, and it, it, you know, they, they, they look at me and they say, I just don't understand why this dog isn't responding. <laughs> and my answer is, well, you're blowing it when the dog points, you're blowing it when the dog runs, you're blowing it when, when, when the dog comes in towards you. He's actually got no idea what that whistle means. <laughs> so you are literally and figuratively blowing it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. Well, well, we could talk the rest of the day and I would love to do this again. So consider yourself invited, but uh, let's end on this note, at least this time around of all the things you see clients do in the field, besides blowing a whistle too much. Um, what is the one thing that, that would help us if we could avoid it? What is the one thing that you would ask us to stop doing? Oh boy, now you're putting me on the spot. Um, um, this, this was um, going to be an article I was planning on writing. Perfect. At, at okay. Some okay. Point. So, so narrow it down um, to 200 words. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Scott, I would say um, not listening to your guide. Um, uh, you know, your, your, your guides are out there, they, they hunt in those areas day in and day out. Um, they know what they're doing. Uh, well, they should know what they're doing. So just uh, listen to the guide. You, you know, if the guide says, hey, we're going to walk around the left side of this tree, don't walk off around the right side of the tree. That, that's probably the one thing that, uh, that gets on my nerves more than anything else. <laughs> yeah, you know, we, we tend to discount the uh, – don't – this could be an entire podcast in itself. So let's save that. Right. I can't wait right. to read your article and more. That's Ryan O'Shaughnessy. His outfit is called West Texas Quail Outfitters. Dot com is where you'll find him, just like it sounds. Uh, and uh, been enjoyable talking about those little devils with the white top knots. And uh, got to do this again sometime down the road. It's been an enjoyable Upland Nation podcast for me. I hope you've had the same. Ryan O'Shaughnessy, thank you for being a part of the Upland Nation. You're welcome, Scott, anytime.
Don't go anywhere. We have much, much more to talk about. Thank you again, Ryan. Sure had a great time. Now I'm going to start talking like you. You know, so we do a newsletter poll every week, but sometimes I like to digress a little bit, and I will this time around, ask a few questions on Facebook that I think are certainly worth taking a look at. One of them being, um, how else can ethical sportsmen and women help habitat? Uh, I meant by else, I listed a few things. For example, limit your kill instead of killing your limit and uh, picking up your empties and maybe somebody else's empties for that matter. But I asked the question and got some interesting answers from a few folks. Greg Scott Long suggests that we stop using lead shot. Yeah, a little easier said than done sometimes, but uh, it will have its desired effect and hopefully more and more manufacturers will help us in that regard. Todd Hendry suggests that everyone you know should be buying a hunting license, even if they don't intend to use it. I would go a step further, uh, knowing what I know about the Pittman-Robertson Act and how conservation really is funded. Everybody should buy a few guns and ammo, too, because that money goes straight to the states, depending on how many hunters they have. And Boyd Staley is doing something uh, a lot of folks are intrigued by. He just bought some brass hulls. He's going to reload his black powder shotgun loads into those brass hulls. Uh, clever idea. Can't wait to hear how that works for you, Boyd. Uh, and that ongoing discussion is at both the Wing Shooting USA and Upland Nation Facebook pages. So, uh... Come on along and make your own suggestions. Here's a chance for me to make a suggestion about um, finding more publicly accessible land for you to hunt. I hope that you will uh, do more and more of that. And if you're looking for suggestions on where to do it, go to findbirdhuntingspots.com. That is my new website new material every week to help you find places to hunt train and care for your dog and more here's one learned this in nebraska a couple seasons ago and flashed on it yesterday put it on the list to discuss with you real quickly do a recon on the entire area before you pull into the tried and true parking spot and drop the tailgate Sometimes you don't have a choice because there's somebody already there. Sometimes the best habitat might be on the other side of that property. You'll never know that unless you've done your scouting, whether it's on the ground or Google Earth or anything else. And three, you might find an adjacent walk-in area that nobody's hunting right now. Paid off for me once in South Dakota just north and a little to the west of Huron. I'll share that story with you someday as well. All right. So another wonderful Upland Nation podcast, at least in my estimation. I hope you learned as much as I did. Appreciate your paying attention. If you liked what you heard, please review the Upland Nation podcast on Apple Podcasts. Thank you, Brittany Upland Man, for your recent positive comments. Please tell your friends. Carry on the discussion at all the Facebook pages. And our quote this week comes from W. Dayton Wedgefarth. I know, I know. He says, regarding his dog, when he looks at me so attentively and gently licks my hands, then he rubs his nose on my tailored clothes, but I never say naught thereat. For the good Lord knows I can buy more clothes, but never a friend like that. Well put, Mr. Wedge Farth. Thank you. I'm Scott Linden. Thanks for listening. See you in the field real soon.